Welcome to the Trill MBA Show. I'm your host, Felicia Ann Rose A. Nuha, aka the Trillist MBA you will ever know. And I'm here to help you survive and thrive in corporate America by giving you the truth and being as real as only I can be. Happy Sunday, everybody! I'm so excited. Welcome back. It's the last week of Black History Month. So I hope y'all enjoyed our 28 days of, you know, celebration that this oppressive society has allowed us. Um, (laughs) So listen, we have talked about love and life these last two episodes. And so again, we're going to stay focused this season on things that help you make working better and help you get better at being your best self at work so you can get these bags, right? It's all about the bags. So question for you. Are you the person who has 511 windows open on your desktop and you're constantly doing the most during the workday? You're up early, you're up late, You feel like you have way too much on your plate. Are you this person? Are you sucking down your favorite caffeinated beverage just to keep the energy going and keep it up and keep working and working and grinding? Well, guess what? If that is you, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it all wrong, people. So today I have a very special guest. And I'm so excited. My friend and we run in these MLT consortium streets together. He is a fellow MBA. His name is Michael Pittman. Michael is a highly accomplished marketing executive. And he is very forward thinking and has principled expertise that blends entrepreneurial thinking, thought leadership with traditional brand management practices. Like he is a badass. If I could afford him, I would hire him. He's worked for some of the most well-known high performing companies. We try and keep our coins, so we're not even going to bring them up. But just know he is one of the most productive and efficient people that I have ever known. And so today I'm going to chat with Michael about his approach to his workload, his projects, and how he unapologetically sets boundaries so that he can deliver high output and value in each of his roles. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, Felicia. How are you? (laughs) I'm good. Thank you for hanging out with me today. I am so excited you're here. I thought for sure you were going to be like, I ain't going on your little show. Um, (laughs) No. I'm I'm honored I get to see you in action. You talk about the show so much. So I'm excited to be on here. And um, that intro was great. Uh, I need to steal it. <laughs> yes, no. I mean, listen, I tell people all the time, I was like, y'all, if I could hire Michael Pittman to help me with my empire, I just can't afford you. And I know that right now. So I'm not even going to insult you with some, can you just come help me for a little bit? Because I know you are a stickler about your time. And I'm so excited because I've learned that from you. And that has been a game changer for me. I have actually started telling people, no. Because I'm like, I got to get focused, my little ADHD over here. So I want to talk to you today about these tips and tricks. So first, uh, we are going to have our Corporate Warrior Spotlight. Today's Corporate Warrior Spotlight goes to Glennis Bryan, CFO of Insight. Insight is an IT solutions company, and they have all kinds of big dog customers from government to public sector to private sector. Brian earned her financial and analytical skills working in transportation and then transitioned to the IT industry, which is no small feat. Her role as CFO isn't just about numbers. 
She leverages her immense experiences in finance to shape strategy, prioritize resources, and make timely, bold investment decisions that lead to meaningful growth. Glennis was raised in Jamaica. Her mother was a financial professional, but Glennis earned a bachelor's degree in psychology before discovering her own talent for financial analysis and management. It led her to an MBA in finance at Florida International University and an internship at Ryder Systems Incorporated. Over the course of 16 years, Glennis honed her financial and analytical skills as she rose to senior vice president of Ryder and CFO of the company's largest business unit, Ryder Transportation Services. In 2001, Glennis was named Chief Financial Officer of APL Logistics, where she applied her skills on a global scale for the Oakland, California-based shipping firm. Her success caught the attention of Swift Transportation, Inc., and in 2005, Glennis became Swift's Executive Vice President and CFO. She was intrigued by the pace of change in the IT industry and by the vision and versatility required to support such a rapidly evolving field. Glennis became Insight CFO in 2007. With a strong team around her, she has helped guide Insight through expansion, recession, and into recovery. She remains an eager and inquisitive student of the IT industry, working to keep the company agile and responsive in an ever-evolving market. So yes, guys, even when you make it to the top, you still got to keep learning. I love, love, love shouting out amazing women like Glennis. They are everywhere, guys. You just have to open your eyes and look. (laughs) So let's get back to the convo with Michael. I want to be a badass like our corporate warrior spotlight, right? And I realized talking with you over the past, like, you know, year or so that I've been doing this wrong. And so first, I want to share with people, like, what is your general philosophy regarding work? Like, what are, like, some of the top rules you live by? Yeah, you know, I think that um, when I think about that, I think the biggest one is that work is just work. Um, Say that. (laughs) Say that. Even though you may find a line of work that you really love and that you're passionate about, which is the goal that we all want, Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, it is just work. So I always try to keep that in mind um, and not let it um, consume me or become me, right? I've been in organizations where um, the organization becomes the person's identity and I don't ever want to be in that position. So I think that's my biggest philosophy. And then because of that, what comes out of that is boundaries. Right. Not being afraid to say no. <laughs> right. Um, and being clear with people um, as much as I can on kind of my expectations in terms of how I'm going to work with them and how I expect them to work with me. Yeah. So what do you do when somebody doesn't <laughs> respect your boundaries? Like, I know you are very much like, working hours core hours are like nine to four those are core hours now and sometimes three right <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> and then outside of that like let's say your manager wants to talk to you at seven o'clock at night and you have established your boundary what do you do in those situations So what I would say is that in most instances, I don't have those things come up. (laughs) Um, And I think that's because very early on, I'm pretty clear on the boundaries, right? So I put documents together, which I think we'll talk about later. But Mm -hmm. I try to talk and be very, when I'm first starting to work with a new manager, and really be clear on what I want to get out of the role, how I work best. And some of that is being a little bit transparent and vulnerable, if you want to say that, in terms of, are you a morning person? Are you a a late person? Mm -hmm. Where do you get the most of your energy from? Um, And I I vocalize pretty early. Like, I try to stay within core business hours. Um, Hmm. 
Mm. And so I, I just put that on the table. Right. And then I think you do that and they go, okay. Mm -hmm. And then you have to make sure that they respect it. So I think that all managers will try to test that. Right. And so they will send you a note. They will try to call you outside of those core hours to see um, how true you are to that. And so you have to make sure that you stay honest with yourself. And if that's your boundary, keep your boundary. So don't respond. And so once I've done that the first few times, right, it doesn't happen anymore. So do you say you just ignore is because th that's what I learned from you, because I had and even with my peers or my coworkers. Right. Because one time one of my coworkers text me on a Sunday and I was like about Monday. So it wasn't like a fun text or a happy text. It was like legit about work. And I was like. That's enough. <laughs> <Ain't no. laughs> look, but you know, the funny thing is, because you know, the iPhone, it'll show you that somebody read you. <laughs> and so what? And I will tell people that too. Like, you can send me something. Right. I may read it. Right. I am not going to respond. Exactly. Unless you tell me like the building's burning down or and I better even respond. Then, even and then. even then, right? So I, I try to be very clear on that. And I think if you're steadfast on that, then what I find is... When I had managers that are reaching out to me, then they start to be apologetic. Like, oh, I'm sorry for reaching out to you, but I'm going to go, okay. Aww. And we might have a brief conversation, but, you know, it's, so it doesn't happen often. That's See, my point. But you have to establish it early. I think one thing that um, I had a mentor, he used to always say, uh, if you keep feeding the tiger, it'll keep eating. Very true. <laughs> and I was like... And you know, it was so funny because sometimes I would just look at him and I would be like, oh. and these companies will do that. Right. And all day long. <laughs> it is so funny. I did not appreciate his old black Greek wisdom. <laughs> yes, we know who you're talking about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I did not appreciate his old black Greek wisdom until in hindsight when I was like finding myself telling my coaching clients these things. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, my God, I sound old. <laughs> I sound old. I sound like an old head. <laughs> well, you know, yes. we've been in this game for a minute. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> my God. Too long sometimes. I'm like, wait. And then I realize, like, I'm nowhere near close to retiring. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> we got to figure this out. Because I just realized working with people like you that are, like, super efficient and super stay with their boundaries because I have another co-worker, uh, ex-co-worker that she was just like <laughs> sometimes you could not find her <laughs> in the day and she lives close to the office. What does she do? Go home be like, yeah, I need some time. I, and take okay. a nap. She would, she's like, again same person that's like you get 80% because I, <laughs> I need to be recharged, right? Like I'm an introvert Y'all got me in all these meetings. <laughs> and so she would block out time on her calendar. Hey. And just, you know, sometimes you just need a mental break. And then she said, you know, there are those times where, okay, I know I need to push, but it can't be push all the time because then I have nothing. And so it's on me, though, to manage that. That's true. And a very powerful. It's funny. You mentioned the word recharge. Uh, and I was thinking about this conversation um, before today, and I wrote that same word down. Um, so I do think it is about managing yourself and making sure that you have ample time and whatever the task is and whatever you feel that you need to recharge and, and maintain a certain level of energy, mental clarity, physical, emotional, so that you can kind of keep going. Yeah, because... Anybody with jobs that are quote unquote high paying, and I say quote unquote because based on my student loans, I'm broke. Okay, let's be clear. <laughs> but they expect a lot. There's this heavy expectation. So before we go to the break, I just want to understand from you how do you manage keeping that balance and meeting those expectations? You know, I think what's important is one, understanding what those expectations are. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes. 
people go into roles and you, and you step into new roles or new projects and new assignments and you don't want to necessarily be perceived as the person who is the dummy or doesn't know. Right. So you don't ask the basic questions up front. But I do every time I'm stepping into a new assignment, a new role, I soak in what I'm hearing and what someone tells me I need to do. Mm-hmm. But then I try to say, let me play that back. Here's what I heard, but I want to make sure I'm clear on the expectations in terms of what it is I'm supposed to deliver. What does success look like in your mind? What's the time frame in which we need to deliver that so that I'm going into it with the right context? Mm-hmm. And then that helps me start to figure out, OK, understanding that, how can I frame up how I'm going to move within this project to keep myself energized and stay true to my boundaries? Oh, that was so good. (laughs) You are amazing. So here's what I heard you just say. What I heard you just say is that you seek for clarity, like unapologetically, you can try to make me seem dumb, but I'm not. And asking those questions and asking for help to understand doesn't, it actually makes you smart, right? So never let anyone make you feel dumb for asking the question. And then the second key thing I heard is that you manage the narrative by managing the expectation. Like you decide how I'm going to move within this project. And so you let them know that ahead of time. You set the narrative, the expectation, and then you deliver on that and boom, a win. You won. And it, and it gives you the leeway to change the expectation Ooh. if you don't believe it's right. So, right, like, projects that I've worked on, I've stepped into it and the manager says, yes, I think you're spot on. This is what we need to do. And it needs to be delivered in two months. And I push back and I say, well, if we want to do that level of work. Mm -hmm. Here's my rationale. And let's align that it's not going to be two months. It's going to be a longer set of time, but it's going to be high quality work. You're only going to have to do it once. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) And so it gives you that opportunity to kind of reset. What I love about that and what's so key is that you're not putting yourself in an unrealistic box that you can't meet. So you have just set yourself up for success and made your boss look good because now they can take what the framework you built in how this project should run and they can say, this is going to deliver us the best work. This is the new expectation. And now again, you look like a rock star. And they manage it with their leaders, right? Right. Oh, Michael, Michael Pittman, y'all, y'all better, y'all better know the name telling y'all when we get back from the break, we are going to get Michael's hacks on organization. And when I tell you my mind was blown, I was like, oh, wait, I'm not supposed to y'all come back. The Trill NBA show is happy to announce a partnership with a fantastic organization named Juno. Juno uses the power of group buying to help people get lower interest rates on new student loans and student loan refinancing. So if you're like me and you got a bunch of student loans and the interest rate is high, Juno can help you get lower interest rates so you can pay off your student loans faster. Listen, I am so excited about this. Why? Because Juno is completely free. It is a free resource. You have no obligation to take the offered deals. Juno gives power back to us, the borrowers, and allows us to take ownership of our financial future. I am so excited about this partnership. And the process to becoming a member is simple. And it only takes two minutes. So check out the link in the show notes to learn more and get lower interest rates on your student loans, y'all. Let's save this money, okay? Now back to the show. And we are back with one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, Michael Pittman. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so here's what blew my mind when we were talking about doing this episode and I was just like, what? So one of the ways you stay organized is that you delete 
all of your emails. Blood out. I do delete all of my emails. If I were to open if I were to open up, I'll tell you, if I open up my work email right now, there are eight messages there. (gasps) What? My mouth is wide open, you guys. I'm not even gonna open it. And I don't do a lot of filing away. So let's it's not like uh, they're all filed away. They're deleted. Okay. I know, right? I like I was like, no, you got to understand. We got the document. We got like, I was going through this whole thing with him, right? Like I was like, but Michael, what about documentation? What if you got to go back? And you said to me, why? <laughs> because that one time. But that one time comes up how, how many times in a year? Once or twice? That once. <laughs> so to me, it, it just, right. It doesn't feel worth saving all of those emails. And I think in that conversation, there's something freeing. And I, it it was actually interesting because it was actually an aha for me having the conversation with Mm -hmm. you because you were asking me and probing. And I was like, well, I've never had anybody really push me on like the hack. And I think for me, where it came to is the action of deleting the emails and getting rid of things is a, it's freeing. So it feels like it actually frees up your mind to be more focused on the projects that you have at hand, the things that you want to accomplish. And you're not cluttering up your head because you have a slew of emails in your inbox or you know you put all these emails in these safe folders off to the side that you probably will never access. (laughs) And so why are you keeping them? So that's a big hack that I learned really early and I try to stay true to that. But I think having that conversation with you is when it came an aha for me. And I was like, yeah, I think that is why I do that. You have just invoked me. Free your mind. And the rest will follow. (laughs) That's totally true. I was like, oh my God. Because for me, I've always kept every email like if you saw my gmail you would get hives like you would you would be like i don't know if i can be friends with you (laughs) because i have emails from 2010 when i like started my gmail account (laughs) wow (laughs) and i go through every now and again and i try to delete junk emails and i i try to empty it but it's so bad it is like a hoarder's episode. Like I would need to hire somebody to like go in there and just have some rules set up and just delete, delete. Like and it probably would take days to do at this point. So at this point, I'm just like, eh. And I've gotten to the point where I've always believed that unread messages don't bother me. But the more I think about it, after you know we talked it's in your about subconscious it. yes that there's all this stuff i need to do right and i'm just like holy shit i'm gonna have to delete my email but then i tried to delete my email and guys you have to have patience with yourself this this will happen to you so i went into my work email and i'm like oh yeah i'm gonna delete these things now especially right now like i'm gonna delete these things like so my audience knows i'm going through a restructure um, so yeah. I'm like, I'm going to delete, like, we just got to delete and clean up. Right. Like this, you don't need this stuff. I deleted like two emails and then my oh. brain was like, I got to go. I could just stop. I, cause I got to one and I was like, Ooh, what if I need this? And I just, I, I and I know, I know you're right. Like yeah, it's like tackle the email. So that's the other thing. Like, sounds like you have a lot of unread emails in your inbox or in other places. Mm -hmm. That's something I don't do either. Like they are read and they are addressed. And once they are addressed, they are deleted. Right. So to me, something comes in. Right. If it is something I can tackle very quickly, tackle it, delete it and move on. It's not in my head anymore. The matter is done. Right. So I think that's a practice that I use a lot. And it's funny you mentioned hives, but I definitely get hives when I see people's inboxes or they, I, and I'll see like, I'm like, what? You have 500? <laughs> like, how do you function? <laughs> oh, oh, let me tell you. My Gmail? Yeah. No. It's tens of thousands. Mm-mm. Tens, like almost, it's close to 100,000. I think how much more freeing that would be if you didn't have that. 
But, you know, I think that's almost like a life philosophy a little bit for me, because when I think when I take a step back and friends and family will tell you this, I have no qualms purging anything. Right. And I think it's just kind of like as you move through life and you do different things, you want to have like a clean start. So, like, I feel like I've moved, you know, there's four or five times. I feel like every four or five times that I've moved, I've kept a few pieces of furniture. But most times I go, get rid of it all and start new. And then people are like, are you going to go through the process of selling and all? Like, no, I don't have time for that. Like, yeah. Want to donate it, do this, do that. But again, it's that thing about purging, clean it up, don't think about it. I'm moving on to a new chapter, a next chapter. So even in my personal life, I think I find myself doing that. And so that plays out in work life too. And see, and it's so much more productive. And (laughs) so not even with work, but with life, right? So right now I'm sitting at this big ass dining room table that I found an apartment to fit it in when I had moved for the last W-2 role. And mind you, this table went into a 2,300 square foot house, right? So it fit right. Mm -hmm. It was perfect. And then I moved into like a 1,200 square foot apartment and it was just configured just right. But you still made it fit. You still tried to make it fit. It fit. So now I have, because of the pandemic and, you know, life, and employment, I moved home to my mom's house, which is like a thousand square feet. And you're still trying to make that table fit. (laughs) This is a hot mess. And the thing is, though, I love this table and I don't want to let it go. But I sit here and I'm like, you have 10 chairs you have this big ass table in this little ass house what are you doing and it's just like i'm just like i don't know and honestly should i like sell the table or you know get rid of the table and and let it go and so that's something i'm gonna have to talk to my therapist about because i think that thing whatever that thing is that fear of letting things Mm -hmm. go it clutters your mind and stops you from being productive, like being productive at home, being productive at work. And it wasn't until you said that. And I freaked out (laughs) that I realized, Oh, this is deeper. This is is something we need to work on. But I know as I continue to grow in my career, I'm going to have to let some things go. Absolutely. I mean, right. Think about senior leaders and the amount of emails and, you know, they're pulled in all different directions. They don't have time to keep all of that. Right. So that's why I think as we move up in the ranks, you start to see leaders and they send shorter and shorter emails. Right. And oh, then you're almost getting crazy. Right. Some of but those- I think that's why, because they're like first in, first out accounting principle. It comes in. I address it. Move on. I got to keep it pushing. Right. Some of those emails are trash, though. Like they are, they are trash. <laughs> Some of it's like, um, what? like you had to write back and be like, um, just so I'm clear, the four yeah. words you just typed meant. <laughs> <laughs> and you might get us, you know, a halfway cryptic message back, right? right? But I think if I think about the arc of someone's career. Think about a junior analyst, and there are you know someone who's very junior, and they're sending a note, and it's. A novel. Yes. And you're like, oh, Jesus, no, we got to work on this child. We can't right? have and all keeping this. all these things and doing all that. And I think as you grow to become a more successful leader and be able to run whole businesses, mm-hmm. you got to get comfortable with not holding on to everything. And so that's a big statement, but it plays out in very tactical ways with things like email. So have you always been this naturally organized? Because even as I look at your background, it looks very pristine. And it's been this way since I've known you. And I'm like, how? Because if you saw my house right now, you'd be like, are you okay? (laughs) Let's talk about it. I am always pretty organized. And I do think that that's just been a way that I've been wired from childhood. So. Oh, you picked up your toys when you were finished playing with them and put them away. I did. I did. <laughs> your mama taught you. Well. I was the I was the person following rules. 
My no, but that's always, good. It's always, I'm not saying it's bad, right? Yeah. I'm just saying. I was the one following the rules. My brother was the one breaking them. I mean, y'all both turned out good kids, though, or good adults. Cool. But here's the thing I love about that is that when you have a direct report, how do you coach them? Like, let's say I worked for you and you saw, like, how what would be the first coaching session <laughs> that we would have? <laughs> so, you know what? Yeah, I think what's really key when you have direct reports and coaching and how I mentor in general is for people to come to the conclusion or the realization on their own. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about just continuing to probe and ask questions. Mm -hmm. So kind of like when we're having the conversation about the emails, right? Right. You're like, well, no, I have to keep all these for the, I'm like, do you? Why? (laughs) Explain, (laughs) right? Like, so (laughs) you continue to ask those probing questions and that's what I do. So hopefully, you know, 10 minutes in, they come to the conclusion on their own, like, oh, I really, don't need all this email Mm -hmm. or, oh, there's a better way that I can think about tackling this project Um, or thinking about how I can, you know, have my own boundaries. So I tend to do that. Um, When it comes to boundaries, though, I'm pretty just firm with uh, people who are working for me that they need to have boundaries. Right. And so the minute that I see that they don't, I usually will just pull them aside, like, you need to set some boundaries for yourself. Right. So when your direct report is trying to email you at 10 o'clock at night. Right. I will tell them to stop. Yeah. I had a direct report um, who started working for me. And the first few weeks, I thought it really was odd. He was like, well, you know, what What time do you usually get in in the morning? And what time do you normally leave? And so I told him. And then I started noticing that he would always make sure he was there before that time. Oh, wow. And he would not leave until after I left. Oh. So I quickly pulled him to the side and said, look, that's not how I operate. That's, that's not going to be good for you. You know, he was married, you know, starting his own family. I'm like, you need to make sure that you're spending time and you have the right boundaries that's going to work for you. Mm-hmm. I could care less if you're sitting here in front of me doing work or you're doing work somewhere someplace else right. as long as we have an open line of communication and when we need to talk we can have an avenue and we find a way to do that but outside of that please don't right and so right. i try to open up that line of communication so that they know that they can do that mm-hmm. and then you have to demonstrate it yourself right so i always mm-hmm. make sure that when i say that then they start to see, okay, he's serious because right. he doesn't respond to my notes after this time. People say, it's quitting time. What are you still doing here? Mm-hmm. And if I don't get up, he's going to be like, well, I'm going to wait for you to pack up your stuff and we're leaving. Right. Right. So you have to model the behavior too. So have you ever worked for a manager that expected response and expected you to be there if they late at night that you gonna stay there late at night with them or if they there early in the morning you gonna be there early in the morning with them i mean we know of one instant (laughs) (laughs) um and that is the only time that i had a situation like that um but it was one of those instances where i felt like okay this may have positive implications for me down the road from a career trajectory perspective or open up other avenues. But I will say this, once it got to the point where I felt like my life was fully out of balance Mm -hmm. and there was no way that I was going to be able to continue, Mm -hmm. that's the conversation I had. Right. Right. With that leadership, that leader and that leadership team, which was, this is not going to work. Right. And once I had that conversation, they pulled back a little, but then they found other opportunities for me um, that'd be a better fit. Oh, good. And it actually turned out well, because then I ended up working on a project that really tapped into um, marketing expertise and other areas where I have passion, which, you know, around people development, right. um, things of that nature. Were you afraid of any negative consequences? I think over time I've learned to be less afraid of negative consequences but i always i think had a little bit of that streak anyway (laughs) good or bad um you mean that f you (laughs) 
a little bit at <laughs> you. Right. Um, but you know, when you're, you know, an associate brand manager and your VP's calling you and you just don't return their call. Right. <laughs> Nice. The next day, they're like, I was calling you. And my response is, and it was outside of core business hours. So right. we can talk about it today. Right. So I've always had that. Um, but I think as you become more comfortable in your own skin and you know mm-hmm. your value and what you bring to the table, I'm not as scared about it. And if there's a negative ramification, then there is. Because... Deal with it. And, you know, the grass will be greener on the other side. And, ultimately usually end up in a better place right you have your sanity back exactly and understand these are people you're dealing with like they're not queens kings holy grails like that i mean even if they were again the kings and the queens as we name these people with these designations they still people they still got to sit on the toilet every day like everybody else very true like that's a tip that people need to understand the the thing that I've been seeing and tell me what you, what you've seen in your career, the separation between people who are ready for the next level and people who aren't are the people who don't have that fear around communicating with senior leaders. They don't have a fear of senior leaders. They don't, they're not constantly thinking about like, Oh my God, I'm going to make a mistake or whatever. They like, own their mistakes, they they take risks, they try new things, and that signals to the organization like, oh, we have a leader. Because leaders, they don't necessarily disrupt to disrupt, but they disrupt with intention and, and with goodwill, and they're trying to push the envelopes for better things. And so when the organization who actually wants that <laughs> and they see that, they realize, oh, this is a leader we have. Because um, the same person who was like, I'm only giving you 80. For that person, what I admire about them is they're like, you know, I have passion around this. And so they told leadership, I have passion around this. This is what I want to work on. This is why it's important. This is how the company makes money. Like, put it all together, you know. And that wasn't necessarily their role at the time. But then the organization's are like, oh, yeah. And then they get pro- promoted, right? Like, because this is a leader. This is somebody who has shown and demonstrated that they can carry parts of the company on their own without somebody telling them what to do. 100% agree. I, I mean, I don't really have anything to add to that. I think you're spot on in terms of when you see somebody who's ready to step into a leader role. It's not always waiting for somebody to tell you what to do. It's seeing the opportunity, being comfortable, expressing that point of view, and then trying to champion that. You know, Michael, we're going to take a quick break to pay some bills. Gotta do that. But when we come back, I want to talk about how you create processes. And then I have something we're going to give our listeners that you created that I'm so excited about. So we're going to talk about that when we get back. All right. So as y'all heard, Chris put me on blast the last episode of season four and pretty much said, you going to ask these people for help and you going to start this Patreon. So I started a Patreon page, working on additional content. Go on over to patreon.com slash Trillinba show and become a patron and help us make more dope content to help us survive and thrive in corporate America. All right, now let's start the show. Okay, guys, I am back with the phenomenal marketing executive, Michael Pittman. He is a member of my MBA uh, network and I have learned so much from Michael. One thing that I was so surprised with as you were sharing some of your tips and tricks and tactics, these you have several different documents over the course of your career that you've created. And I was like, well, I'll be damned. Why didn't I think of this? And so when we were talking earlier about how you set those boundaries, I think one of the documents you've created is so key and it is an onboarding document. It is. So what drove you? Tell me the story behind like 
what, where were you? What level were you in your career? Were you like, I, you know what? I'm tired of y'all mofo. Let me write some shit down for y'all because y'all <laughs> not going to be explaining this. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, um, I don't think I can take full credit for it. So, but after I finished uh, my MBA, the organization that I joined at that time, you know, they do a lot of moving around of talent. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to quickly come up to speed every time you move into a new project. And they would have these work with type of onboarding meetings. Mm -hmm. And some of the leaders would have like a really brief document and it would have, you know, just the whole bullet lines of their expectations. So I kind of took that and just decided to run with it and do it on steroids and continue to build on it over time as I learn more about myself, right? Mm -hmm. So it started with really basic things like, do you prefer emails? Do you work in the morning versus the afternoon? You know, basic. But I think over time, I have continued to build that document out with more things in terms of like how I'm wired. What are the things that keep me charged and energized about work versus the things that are drainers? Mm -hmm. Um, What are my passions? What are my expectations from managers, people Mm -hmm. who work for me and so forth? And that's come through, I think, a lot of self-reflection, taking the time to do all of those self-development strength finders and those type of tools Mm -hmm. but then being figuring out the right way to package them up in a succinct manner so they almost tell a little bit of a story right in that document and so that's what i've done and i use it religiously and continue to build on it all the time it's kind of like a living breathing document for the last 12 years yes and so if you sign up for patreon I have stolen Michael's document and created a template. So I took all his information out, but I left the template of it that can get you started on creating this type of onboarding document for you. And it's really great when you're starting at a new company, when you're starting a new role in the same company. It's a Word doc. It's it's a simple yet powerful tool to help you set your boundaries to help you have the conversation and get grounded in that very first one-on-one. And I've talked about it season after season. You create the one-on-ones, you manage your own one-on-ones, right? With your- I I think that's super powerful statement too. And in using that document, what I have found is when I've moved to other organizations where that's not a standard, or even if it is, I've gone into that first meeting with my new manager on a new project and be like, hey, I wanna have this work with meeting. And they're kind of like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And I keep it very genetic. Oh, just so we understand how we work together, make sure they have a, we start this new journey together with a great working relationship. And then they see the amount of time and effort and thought that's gone into it. Mm-hmm. And so then they usually end up coming back on their own and being like, this was so great. I hadn't even on my own thought about all of this. And so then they come back and they share a lot more about themselves with you, mm-hmm. yes. which is only going to benefit you. Right as an employee working with them or having people work for you and then you're going to be able to deliver better work, vice versa. You're going to make each other look good because you kind of know how you're wired, your strengths, your weaknesses and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely sparked really good discussions with managers that I've had. Right. And then do you feel like that also helped you build a strong relationship with those managers? Yeah. And then you can continue to build on it. I mean, I think, right, you do have to be, have a little bit of vulnerability and talk through maybe, hey, where you need an accountability coach, right? Right. So, you know, I would say earlier in my career in some of those documents, what I had been told in the past is like, you have a really strong point of view, but you're not always vocal with that point of view. Really? I know. (laughs) Doesn't doesn't seem like that would be my issue now, but (laughs) earlier in my career, definitely. Ah. So in those work with meetings, you know, I would just straight up ask, right? hey, here's what I know is an opportunity for me. So I know you're my manager, but I also want you to kind of serve as a little bit like it's my accountability coach. And if you see me in meetings or things we're in together, where you just get a feeling like I have something to say, but I'm not saying it, Mm -hmm. you know, call me out on that, right? Um, Hold me accountable. And so I think having managers that did that early on and saw that I was vulnerable and being open to saying I want the help, I got that. Um, And I think that's why now that's not 
that's not an opportunity. <laughs> right. <laughs> so now, since you are very self-aware, which is one thing I love about you, what do you think is your biggest opportunity in your career going forward as you continue to climb the executive ranks? You know, I think the biggest opportunity for me is for the longest time, and I think early in your career, I think that's the right move, so I wouldn't change anything. Um, I made a lot of moves for the job opportunity itself. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer in getting different experiences, and so I moved different companies, um, did different type of roles. Mm -hmm. I think to be a successful leader running a large organization um, at this point, it's finding some place that you really feel like you can fit in, like that you right. fit the culture, that you have something to contribute in an impactful way. Mm -hmm. So those opportunities that are big and people you're going to learn from. Yeah. So I can be self-aware, but in that self-awareness, I still have lots of things to learn. Right. And for me, I think that's what's going to be key to get to the next level is finding a place fit the culture and that there's the people the right type of leaders that i can learn from so do you feel as a person of color and you know in the function you work in there may not always be a bunch of men <laughs> there definitely is not <laughs> so so do you how do you navigate fit when yeah. you might not naturally, you might just naturally not kind of fit in. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's funny. I mean, I don't know that I, when I'm looking for fit, it doesn't necessarily need to be somebody who looks like me. Right. So that's ideal and that's great. And I need to see that somewhere in the organization, but it doesn't always necessarily need to be in the function or the team that I'm on. Mm -hmm. But I do want to see people that I think think the same way that I do, but yet challenge me to think differently, push my thinking, mm -hmm. um, and organizations where they embrace people with uh, different skill sets and, and different personalities. So yes. that's more what I'm looking for when I say I need somebody that I can learn from. It doesn't have to be diverse. It doesn't have to be a, a, a male. Right. Um, but it is important that I feel like I'm challenged, I'm pushed, and I'm learning. And so with that, there has to be elements of discomfort. Right. If that's not there, I'm not learning anything. So That's fair. What do you say to, you know, for me, I think what I'm looking for on my journey is... Um, <laughs> I'm be real. I'm looking for entrepreneurship. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Hey. I was, just, I was like, <laughs> you know I, what? No, I don't want to go. I don't want to. But, <laughs> but I think you have to know that too, right? Like some people are born to be entrepreneurs. I, Felicia, you're born to be an entrepreneur, right? Like, I mean. Early on, people would be like, Michael, have you ever thought of being an entrepreneur? No, not really. I don't know that that's really what I want to do. I'm like, I just want to be, you know, a high level corporate executive. And yeah. I'm good. Yeah, so I think you need to know yourself. But see, this is the thing. I like, so I remember, so when I was in business school, it was the summer in between my first and second year. I was on my way to my internship on the East Coast. And the announcement came out that Ursula Burns was the first Black woman CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And I was like, oh, yes, I can do it. Right? Because I mean... I had worked for these mid-sized companies before business school and I always thought like, oh, I could I could run this. Right. Like I just always mm -hmm. I was always like, I can I, I would look at the leaders, like the ha ha, like the C suite, like CEOs, and be like, they're doing it wrong. Like for real, I was real arrogant as a child, as as a younger uh junior person <laughs> before I went to business school. And then I got really excited because that gave me hope, you know, and she had natural hair. And I was like, mm -hmm. ah, then I graduated and I started working. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you lost all hope. <laughs> you know, one thing I'm really excited about is to see Rosalind Brewer yes. named um, 
CEO of Walgreens. She starts March 15th. Very excited about that. She is the second one. And th- th- there's always an asterisk next to that because Mary Winston in 2019, she's on the board of Bed Bath & Beyond and they made her interim CEO until they found the white guy that they wanted. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a black woman always cleaning up shit. Um, so I just, <laughs> you know, I, I don't count that. And to me, that doesn't count. Like, she was on the board. She is capable, yes. Like, clearly, she's on the board. Like, <laughs> the board is the boss of the CEO. They're the ones who are really right. Right. <laughs> So she just, you know, it's like your direct report leaves and you fill in the gap until you hire somebody else. That's what she yep. did. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm torn still, Right. Because right now I'm in this holding pattern and I don't know where I'm going. Um, But I know for sure that if I continue on this corporate path, I have got to find an organization that sees me as future CEO. I have got to get there. I just I have yet to get there. And yeah. and it's been a struggle. And I want to be honest about that with my listeners because, you know, I had a coaching client I was talking to yesterday and we were having a great discussion. And, and she was like, I just don't not know how to get them to let me in. And I was like, they... But that's not the organization you want to be part of. Right. So <laughs> I think that's the tough. Yeah. And so that's why when you asked me, you know, earlier, what do you think is key for you to continue to move up in your career, it is finding an organization that sees huge potential in you mm-hmm. to move multiple levels and be, you know, an executive level seat suite officer. Whether or not you get there, um, right, things come up, but you want that. Right. Um, and I think we've all had, you know, bumps in the road, but I do think sometimes it's really challenging for um, anybody, but I think minorities in particular, who mm-hmm. feel like they need to continue to go into these big organizations, small corporate, you know, organizations, and prove themselves because that's the way that we've grown up. Right. To make them see that I have this potential and that I can do this, and I think being self-aware, being comfortable in your own skin, that comes with time. But even myself, right? I've had my own struggle. We've talked about this, where you have to start to take that step back and say. If they don't see it, I know my value, I know my worth, and then that just means this is not the organization for me. Yeah. I would say the only advice I would give to everybody is try to discern that as fast as possible. As fast as you can. Try to leave as soon as you can. Because right. you do just not ag- do not ignore the small signs and signals. Right. And when you see them, you know, if you still think there's something there that can work to your advantage, but then develop a game plan and and what's going to be that exit strategy. Right. And I think, you know, one thing I'm really learning is the importance of our networks. And I look at every opportunity I've gotten. It is truly stemmed from business school connection. I'm like, it's (laughs) all through network. I'm like, I I can learn something from you on that one. Listen, I'm like, what is happening? But I really, one thing I tell people and people are like afraid to reach out to people. They're afraid to network. And I say, when you're in a place of, okay, I, I have a job. I'm good. Don't stop having intentionality around networking. And what I try to do is I'm always trying to connect people, right? And I'm always trying to put pennies in that piggy bank because it's someday I'm going to have to smash that bitch open and be like, okay, got to go to no, the bank. Right. <laughs> you're going to take a, you're going to need a withdrawal. Exactly. Yes. And so I'm always focused on how can I put in, how can I put in, how can I put in and always trying to help, you know, us, right? Like especially, yeah. but also my alums from Kelly, Consortium alums. Um, hell, I wasn't in MLT, but I'm down for MLT too, right? Like, so all all those people who, you know, there's a mission that we're trying to do and we're really trying to bring society along to the better place it's really meant to be. 
outside of this craziness <laughs> that still persists today, right? So I think for you, you are the epitome of the pie model. And I talk about this in the first episode of this season. And I talked about how it's important. Performance is important to career success, but it's only 10%. Your performance is like, oh, whoa. <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know. I'm like, how did you get like this? <laughs> how are you so efficient? And I mean, you look good. You smell good. You know, <laughs> like... <laughs> So image, you got that on lock. Um, it's sad that image is a part of it, but it, it is. is. It is. And I'm realizing that. And something, one thing that scares me, you know, I'm from the country. I don't, I don't, I'm not basic, like whatever that means. Like, I don't feel like that. But I feel like I'm very, you know, T-shirt, jeans kind of You're person. Very casual. Right? Very casual, very down to earth. And what I'm seeing reflected, because even I was looking at pictures of Rosalind Brewer, who has been a very high senior executive for a very but long she's time. she's involved. I, well, that's the thing. You can't see that evolution, right? Like, all I see is the hair, makeup, wardrobe, like, high res pics. And I'm like, do I need to show up like that? And even, like, some of the senior leaders that I've, you know, worked with and seen that are black women over the course of my career. And I'm like, oh, I'm not that. And that scares me because I'm like, do I have to show up? And it's sad, right? So that's why when you say pie, your pie model and part of it is image. And you're like, oh, you've got the image down and that's fine. That's why I was like, it's just unfortunate, right? Because I do think you're the type of person ever since I've known you who tries to bring your full authentic self. Uh-huh. <laughs> to work. I'm trying. That includes your image, right? And yeah. in some cases, and I'm sure you've seen, you know, you get some reactions like, oh, whoa, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so she's just going to cry on this Zoom call about George Floyd. Hell yeah, you're going to see these tears today. I'm keeping this camera on. Right? I ain't even trying to hide this from you. Coming me. up with a head wrap <laughs> to work or something. Yes, right? yes. Uh, and on the Zoom with my head wrap. Mm hmm. Sure did. Sure did. I listen. And, and you should be able to do that. But I do think there's a tax. I feel a tax and I, I'm trying there's a tax, to figure and if you that want out. To propel, yeah, it's like I don't you know, I don't know what the right answer is to that. I have definitely seen black women because mm -hmm. I know your audience is very female who have um, evolved and they feel like they have a persona or a brand that they need to um portray yeah. to get to those executive and those senior levels. Yeah. So Not do you feel thing. that? Do you feel that pressure? I don't think I feel that pressure as a man. I don't think we have that much pressure that way. Right. Because you just have to put on a suit. Like. Right. <laughs> well, you know, honestly, I don't think I have ever worked anywhere that required a suit. Fair. And at this point, I would never... <laughs> work anywhere <laughs> that required a suit <laughs> okay wait but i feel like everybody got a number michael and i feel like a certain role with a certain number you put that suit on um, you don't think i don't know it would have to be a really high number but again this is like staying true to who you are knowing yourself how do you want to come to work and what makes you most comfortable i just don't think i would be comfortable in any type of role where the expectation was, I need to come every day in like a suit. Well, I'm not thinking every day. Just, you know, sometimes. No, no, no not I never. I mean, at this point, right? I go and invest in nicely fitted, tailored shirts that are meant to be worn on top. Right. <laughs> so I can be comfortable. Yeah. The other part of that model, which is huge, is exposure. Yeah. Do you feel like you have mastered that, that you understand how to get the right exposure? I think I know how to get the right exposure. <laughs> Do I always, you know where I'm going? Sometimes, you know, I just don't care about it. Mm. But I, I think I understand the need for exposure. I want it to be authentic and meaningful exposure as opposed to just exposure for exposure's sake. Right. So... I've worked with people. We've worked with people. 
but they're just out there trying to make sure they're showing up on, on right. all the meetings and their right. name is on all the projects, even if they're not really super involved. And right. so <laughs> they're getting a lot more exposure, but right. it's not quality exposure. So I look more for quality over quantity and something that's impactful and meaningful. So do I get less exposure? Yes. But the exposure I get is pretty big exposure. Um, it's on big, meaty projects right. um, where I'm leading it, I'm presenting it, I'm talking about the impact it can have on the organization. And so I found that to be a better approach. Right. And that approach in the right organization will, definitely, right organi- will yes. definitely play off. It's got to be in the right organization. It has to be in the right organization. If you, listeners out there, are in an organization where let's just say Becky is running around the organization and she's always trying to get on high visibility projects. So much so that she might be in a meeting say, this is a high visibility project. Um, just know that peep game, right? Peep game mm-hmm. that you're in an organization where, again, performance is already low. And I think in those organizations, performance is even a lower bar. Like, I think there's some rule. I don't think that... 10, 30, 60 percentage. I don't think that holds true for every organization. I think I've been in some organizations where I think it's been like five, (laughs) maybe four, three percent is your just make sure you make up that you did some shit. Like, (laughs) just write something down. Just write something down. (laughs) Because things change. So one thing you have to understand, if you're in an organization where things change a lot, it's hard to track your actual performance if you're working on, you know, one thing this month, another thing, another month. And it's just, you're just trying to, you know, juggle balls in the air. And then you look back at the end of the year and you're like, so what did I do? I mean, you tired, you were busy. You did a lot of PowerPoint. (laughs) That's how marketers talk PowerPoint. (laughs) Yeah. That's how we, that's, that's the language. Right. (laughs) And so, But then at the end of the year, what have you really accomplished? So one thing I want to ask you is how do you keep track of that? Or do you track it? Like in your organization and your efficiency, like, because I know like for you, you're very much like, I stay focused. I don't multitask. So that tripped me out too when you said that. (laughs) I was like, you don't what? So wait, do you close your email down when you're working? Like if you're working on a slide or slides for a project, do you close your email down? No, I mean, but it's not us. I'm working on the slide. Y'all Focus heard that. On one thing at a time. Focus on one thing. That's the most important thing. <laughs> Focus on one thing at a time at and a time. get that thing done. It's done. Or get it to whatever the milestone is that you, you set for that day, right? I mean, you can't finish everything all at once, right? If you're working on bigger projects. But again, I've say when is work due again it's managing the workflow the first in the first out so i try to get really clear on when stuff is due and i manage by that so wait you don't get up in the morning and like okay these are this was my to-do list because i always imagine you being the person that at the end of the day like right like the 10 minutes before five o'clock when you about to be i'm done Mm -hmm. sit up there okay in the morning i these are my three priorities for tomorrow and this is my to-do list so no, I don't do that. But the funny thing is, and I, I think it's funny your viewers can't see. So I tried that. So last year, one of my New Year's resolutions was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, try this, you know, being really focused. I found this thing called a full focus planner. And within it, it literally has like all these days where you exactly what you're talking about. You can't right. see it, but yeah, it has like. You know, my biggest wins after action review, how far did you get? What did you work on? What didn't work? Blah, 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 blah. And it goes on and on. Right. How many days? I I did it. How many days? Well, it was a whole quarter. Oh, you made Um, a whole quarter. Yeah, I have never got past week one on those. Every I I had tried for years and years, but it was too much. And so because that's just not how I operate. So I don't tend to operate off of um, physical to do list. Right. I think I just keep a a mental note. And again, the whole idea of not having too many things that are cluttering up my head. 
Right. I kind of can keep track of like, what are the top things that I need to be working on? Um, and, and staying focused on that. I give myself deadlines and put them in my calendar. That's my new thing. And it works. I also have a VA. Uh, (laughs) So I have hired my own assistant. (laughs) And she sends me reminders. Remember, you said you wanted to get this done by this day today. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And then I thank you. (laughs) Because mind you, but after I talked to her on Fridays, come Monday, I done made a whole new priority set that I, I I don't forget. She like, don't forget. Right. And so it's been, it's been great. This is new and it's been great. So if you are an entrepreneur and you work a W-2 job, that little 20 something dollars an hour, if, even if it's just for 10 hours a month, like it's so helpful to have somebody with, you're not organized to help you get organized because everybody's not going to be organized and efficient like the great Michael Pittman. So... <laughs> But if you do it a little bit, then it just starts to become natural and you don't think about it anymore. Yeah, um, do I don't that. Think of, I don't think about a lot of <laughs> hacks and things. To me, it's just like, this is just what it is. Right, because so. you're, you're that good. <laughs> <laughs> like, really, I feel like organization separates high performers from... Yeah, I do think high performers tend to be more organized. Than, yeah, and mm-hmm. so... I'm glad I've always been able to lie my way out of those questions. Uh, If any person asks me, I'm highly organized. I'm very detail oriented. I am neither of those. And so you just have to be self Right. Well, you have to. That's the expectation. So you just lie and you say you are and then you find ways around it. But the thing about me is I, I tend not to miss deadlines. Like I really stay focused on like what's due and make sure it gets in on time. Now I'm not saying I don't never miss no deadline, but it's like low hanging fruit things that don't really matter. Right. On big things. It's important. Done, done and done and done early. And then loudly communicated that Felicia got it done. (laughs) That's, that's kind of been my uh, fame is execution. But what happens when, you are known for something. Like, I think you are known for strategy. Mm -hmm. I am known for execution. So what happens when you're known for something as if you can't do something else? Like, what what advice would you give people to work to create a more well-rounded picture of their capabilities? And I'm asking for a friend. And Hey, I mean, <laughs> the struggle's real. It's real. So um, I agree. I mean, I think that, and this is something that I struggle with all the time, it's like you mentioned, over the years, I think there's power in leaning into where your natural strengths are and where you have passion, because that's when you're going to do really great work. Mm-hmm. And so probably in the last four or five years of my career, it's really been focused on portfolio strategy, brand strategy, and really leaning in there, really thinking about where you can take a brand or a business next. But I do, you know, to be honest, struggle sometimes that then on the flip side of that, Mm -hmm. they're like, well, you're not an executor. You can't run the day-to-day business. Um, So (laughs) I think I know that not to be true. Right. (laughs) Um, But, you know, for sometimes that's hard for other people to see. So I think that some of the ways that you can try to tackle that is if you're in an organization, one, I think this is maybe another Mm -hmm. document that I have put together Mm -hmm. is just reminding people because they may have only seen you in one type of capacity and don't know the full breadth of your experience. So I put together something that's like a highlight reel, but Mm -hmm. it's, you know, on a one pager that really speaks to and showcases the full breadth of my experience Mm -hmm. from early career to now. So that they can go, oh, I didn't realize that you had done all this execution, activation type work early in your career. So I think that that helps. And you just have to continue to remind people of that, mm-hmm. shop that around. And other, organiz- uh, other, excuse me, other organizations that I've been a part of, I did a lot more of that shopping around. Right. So people will say, I know that this is the one role, but we shouldn't forget they can do all these other things. And then if you can get assignments and projects that allow you to showcase that that would be the advice that i would give yeah getting those (laughs) i if i have learned one thing in this panoramic (laughs) 
get yourself some visibility. Mm-hmm. Be on the right Zoom calls, the right Teams calls, the you know, be all in the mix, like be nosy. Yeah, in some cases, even if you're not even doing anything, right? They'll yeah. just start associating you with the execution, that project, and the success of that project. Because they're like, oh yeah, Felicia was on all the calls. Yeah. And <laughs> certainly played a role. Right. And next thing you know, people are like, oh, she could do that. And it's like, she ain't did shit. But I <laughs> <laughs> don't know different. Right. <laughs> Listen, y'all, navigating these spaces is tricky and you just have to be intentional. But I think the biggest lesson I've learned from you, Michael, is to thine own self be true. And one thing I'm very, very proud to have learned from you is to be true to myself, do beastly work and really, truly like our networks will carry us very, very far. And know that someone else will recognize your beastliness, right? Yes. Uh, if it's not the place you're at, somebody else will. Yes. Yes, they will. Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on to the show. Based on this convo, you know, everyone should really understand that you will not let people steal your time. But if there's somebody that wanted to connect with you, what might be the best way to do that as well as the you know acceptable reasons to reach out to you and i see you making this face (laughs) no um i'm on linkedin so i would say that that's the best place to try to reach me so they can certainly reach out to me there send me a note okay just make sure you're specific about (laughs) what it is you would like to discuss and why we should connect um, not just connect for the sake of connecting <laughs> to yes. say that I have X number of people in my network, but I'm open. I'm always open to chatting with people and if I can help them or they can help me, right? Cause you want it to be a two way street. I'm, I'm here for it. So. As always in this game of corporate, you know, we are not married, Michael and I, we are single corporate warriors. <laughs> Yes, we are. (laughs) And if you hear this episode and you want to inquire about getting a very beastly marketing strategist, uh, strategist, innovator, innovator, like portfolios, strategy, lots of I mean, just does it. Like I said, if I had a company, I don't even, I could have like a software tech company. I could have a healthcare company. I I don't like I wouldn't even care if you had any passion about the industry my company was in. I'd be like, "Look, Negro, I need you to come here. I need you to set this stage for me and I need you to get these folks in line and I need I need you to make me some money." <laughs> How much? Like <laughs> What salary do you want? Love it. Well, um, I appreciate that endorsement. That is great. Listen, I have seen the glory. Okay. I'm all in. I, I told people, I was like, I if I had to bet money on somebody in this corporate world, it would be Michael Pittman. So please don't forget me. I won't. You when... don't forget me. You're the one who's the rising podcast queen and <laughs> doing all your greatness. So <laughs> why when you said that podcast queen, I heard welfare queen in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, these student loans got me on welfare. I mean, <laughs> oh, bills, bills, bills. Oh, Michael, thank you so much. Now, listen, everyone, if you need help with a specific situation, you can always go to trulymba.com slash coaching. Uh, the prices went up for a 45 minute coaching session. They are $100. Uh, I have had so much success. Uh, the last coaching call I had at the end of the year, so it was in November, at the end of November, beginning of December, a month later, <laughs> the person was in a restructure. She was oh. getting laid off, right? So not only did she get her severance and her package, but she had lined up a new job. Because of my advice, she went for a higher title. She's making 40 grand more a year. So Love she it. got a new job making way more money and got her set. Like she came up 
from a hour conversation while I was in line at the Chick Fil A because you know I like Chick Fil A. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then I realized, and that's been happening, and I'm like, you need to check. Listen, y'all, I got You know bills, I've been saying that forever. <laughs> loans. Uh, <laughs> so I'm way more than where I'm still not charging enough. I just, I want to be able to help as many people as I can, right? But also I have to put my oxygen mask on first. So I'm not going to be a hypocrite for once. Mm-hmm. But you can always ask me questions. Ask at trillmba.com. You can email me. If I can't answer them, I don't know. Or let's say I know Michael knows. I can connect you with him. You know, hopefully, you know, he's a real stickler about his time. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> we're here to help. We're, we're always we're down to, to help. help. We're always down to help. So again, that's trillmba.com slash coaching to schedule a 45 minute session with me. Or you can hit up ask at trillmba.com and submit your question or concern. So until next time, guys. Keep it true. The Trill NBA Show is a Fair World Corp LLC production. Executive produced by Felicia and Rose Inuha. Sound design and editing by Chris Mann with Pod Shaper. Theme music is Kick Push by Ryan Little. Keep it true every day, y'all.